Hey man, how's it going? Really good. I just got my first harmonizer pedal, so I'm sitting here making bad Steve Vai noises. <laughs> oh, awesome. That's fun. Yeah. Now, um, I, uh, this interview is from my podcast, and a recent guest of my podcast is Mr. Earl Skakel, who I know you, you know. <laughs> no way. Yeah. How funny. Uh-huh. Awesome. No, I heard you, um, yeah. you guys on his podcast recently, and um, yeah, he's a, he's a funny guy. Yeah, that guy's ridiculous in the best way. I'm a big fan. <laughs> totally. Um, so, man, I'm so stoked that you guys are coming down to Australia. Um, but unfortunately, I'll be in California for NAM, so I'm going to miss it. <laughs> oh, no, yeah, of course. And, you know, I always hate missing NAM because it's always a blast get to hang with all the just all the people that I represent as far as a musician. And just it's the best. I always try to make it down. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's the thing. It's like a massive, you know, summer camp or something where all your guitar nerd buddies are there, you know? <laughs> oh, yeah. It's the greatest. It's always just... I always look forward to it because, it's, you know, it's not so far for me to get to either. Like, I live in Vegas, you know, and Anaheim is just... Uh, it's like almost just a little over three hours, you know? Mm. Super easy. Yeah, yeah. So, dude, I never doubted for a second that Slash would keep this band together, but... I'm so glad he has because, you know, you have such an identity at this point and, you know, it would be a shame to lose that. And you just keep getting stronger and stronger. Yeah. I agree, man. I mean, it's something that, uh, I mean, he even said, I've heard him explain it in interviews prior, like, you know, when you have something, and I'll say, like, I, I agree with him that when you have a band of, of guys that really gets along this well and just enjoys making music like this, it's like you don't want to let go of it. It's like you can hang on to it as long as it works, you know? And and uh, it's like nothing's forced. It's all just been flowing fairly easy for, my, well, seven years for me and nine years for the band. So yeah. pretty crazy. Yeah. But I appreciate you saying that. Cause it's like it's only, it definitely has felt like um, it's just gotten stronger for, I mean, just the connection between all of us and just the hang, it's been great. Yeah. Well, um, you're probably familiar with the Australian chain JB Hi-Fi. It's like, you know, CDs and everything. Yeah, of course. Um, yeah, every uh, single... I one of there. Yeah. <laughs> every single time I go into JB lately, they're playing the record. So someone at my local JB oh, awesome. must be a massive fan. And... That's so cool. Yeah, and it, it really stands out, you know, and you, I've heard a few people saying, you're like, hey, what's this? You know, asking at the counter and stuff, so... Yeah. Yeah. So That's great. Where, uh, what part of Australia are you in? Uh, I'm in Melbourne, uh, St. Kilda. Oh, you're in Melbourne. Okay, cool, yeah. cool, cool. Love it. Yeah. So, um, what, what was the recording process for this record like? Did you have to kind of squeeze it in between, you know, Guns N' Roses commitments and stuff? Yeah, definitely. It was that, that, that threw a bit of a wrench into the whole thing, but it was not like... And I, I say that without any sort of bitterness. I just it's all good. It was something that I think needed to happen. So, um, we were just in the middle of the, of the process, kind of like we, uh, usually during sound check, Slash will present a, a riff or something, some idea and he'll just play it. And then we always play along. We kind of formulate, um, some kind of framework to the song and then we'll revisit it the next time we sound check. And we always, uh, come back around whenever we can to maybe a rehearsal room and just try to, piece everything together and so we had done that once or twice and you know this next uh, I think what was it it was like the, the last US tour we did for World on Fire Flash told us about the Guns reunion so there's a bit of a hold you know and mm -hmm. then uh, once we came back around I think it was this last November December January February March we uh, we made this album and it was just we just got in that room and essentially uh, over the course of however many months it just it just it came out naturally I don't know I loved it it just that process was super super organic you know third album it just felt like uh, like cool alright here we go and and it was over so fast yeah. <laughs> crazy how quick that went by yeah so um, what is your uh, what kind of gear are you using on the record are you the kind of player who will stick with one guitar or are you using lots of different stuff on different tracks yeah, well, what's cool is that our producer is a guitar player, but, you know, that's, obviously he's a producer, he can play anything, but, like, his his thing was guitar, so when it came time to play guitars, it was just so 
fun because he had a lot of great ideas, a lot of cool, just little little tweaks he would do with pedals, little cool things like that. And um, it really just brought out such a, uh, there's a lot of color in, in these parts. And so um, for me, picking the right guitar and the right amp for these songs is just super important to me. So um, I ended up, I played uh, all sorts of, like, you know, I tried not to play Les Pauls, obviously, because it's like, you don't want to play the same thing that Slash is playing because it kind of just it blends a little too too close together. It's hard mm. to decipher. So for me, I ended up playing um, uh, my Gretsch Duo Jet. Uh, I played a Les Paul Junior. You know, like P90s are really cool. I, it's one of my favorite things to play. Um, and I played uh, a 1968 SG Melody Maker, if you can believe it. Yeah. Then we played. Uh, I have a 1976 335 that I played, um, and I wrote it all down. I made it a point to like write down everything. I have it all on my phone, just yeah. just in case for the guitar people uh-huh. <laughs> like myself that care, yeah. you know. Uh, but the amp I used on the entire thing was a it's a modded JCM 800 Marshall. Uh, it's a I think it's a I, I believe it was Slash's amp. And uh, it's really cool. It's like it's how he modifies it. It's like there's something in the game structure that he, I didn't even know what it was, but it was like, man, this amp just rules. So uh, we just went with that the whole time. And um, it's just a good time playing with Elvis, too. He just gets it, you know. Yeah. Super fun. Yeah, no, I've interviewed a few people who have worked with him, and they always say the same thing. Like, man, he brings along all this stuff. and <laughs> yeah. yeah, he's just psyched, and he's, he's you know, he loves what he does. None of it's boring. None of it's like, you know, he's not trying to get out of the room. He just wants to hang and keep playing. It's just a blast. Yeah. Um, so what do you do to keep yourself busy musically when, you know, when Slash is off doing his thing? Uh, well, I did a couple things um, in the meantime. I mean, I jam with other people uh, from time to time. done, you know, little gigs here and there with um, other people musicians but one of my favorite things that I got to do and we did a bunch of gigs in Vegas it was a homegrown thing but um, I put something together uh, it was kind of like um, like you know how Lenny Kravitz has like 10 12 people on stage yeah like he has like the backup singers he has keyboards he's got a horn section so I kind of went to school off of that that was kind of my idea of like right well I want to put something together like that and we'll just play covers and then eventually we'll write if we want and so we did this thing in Vegas where we played all over town and it was like a just it was like more kind of like you know we played like James Brown and played cool stuff like that you know and uh, it was just a real explosive show it was a lot of fun so I kind of got to do that and get some um, just play covers and have a blast it was really uh, just a personal thing I always wanted to do so it was like we got to do that for a long time and then uh, other than that there was you know just the contact from Slash, like, all right, dude, so here we go, let's get back together. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> cool. Um, yeah. Now, um, I guess one of the other things that occupies your time is I follow you on Instagram, and you have some amazing, beautiful pets. <laughs> oh, yeah, dude, thank you. <laughs> I'm a big animal person, and uh, yeah, my animals are, are my life. Yeah, tell me about I the fox. about that. Tell me about the fox. That thing is beautiful. Yeah, no, he's, uh, he was... Well, okay, the way I came into him was, uh, you know, I had been a big animal person my whole life, and I had always wanted a fox, and I, just years and years, that was, that was never a possibility, like, you just couldn't get one, mm. especially in Nevada, it's illegal, um, but for me, over time, and years and years of research, and eventually connecting to the right people, I got to... Uh, I got a hold of some people in Utah and remember like in Vegas the nearest person to go get a fox from was like in Indiana I believe so you'd have to fly with one mm. so it was so tough for me it's like that means I'm going to have to get all sorts of crazy permits even before I have him like I can't even like get near him essentially it was just going to be a whole thing so what we ended up doing was uh, kind of I mean against the, the rules at first but it's okay now because we ended up going through uh, these people that weren't really breeders that kind of rescued foxes uh-huh. from fur farms and they ended up uh, they ended up having litters you know so then I ended up getting one mm. from them and uh, just drove to Utah got them or got him and then uh, got him in Vegas and then I had to build like an enclosure I had to build all sorts of stuff in the house 
get it approved um, by the uh, USPCA to make sure everything um, made sense. It's like it had to be 100%. So it's like this was, you know, like, you know, you're okay to have a fox in your house, but someone has to approve that. <laughs> like, yeah. Uh, and it's not like a huge illegal thing. It's just something that isn't approved yet. Like it's legal in Utah, legal in certain states around you. But uh, to shorten this up here, it's like he he's hilarious. He's just a very silly animal, very cool, uh, highly, highly intelligent, very, very aware, you know, and he's, he's not a wild animal. They, they're, they're considered tame. So when you have an animal such as him and you raise him uh, and all he knows is humans, growing up that's considered tame so you have like wild where they're born in the wild you have tame and then you have domesticated and uh you can now get domesticated foxes from russia yeah fun fact wow <laughs> yeah so he's cool as hell and then i have a husky too yeah she's uh she's just very goofy goofy dog oh, she's, she's the best <laughs> she's beautiful <laughs> you know i i tell you yeah. every time i open instagram i'm just stalking for people's pets it's like you know i've got yeah, and I don't blame you, dude. I, I do the same thing. Yeah. I just got a rescue kitten, and it's hilarious because he is so intelligent. Like, I've had cats before, and we've got a dog, but this cat, I swear he's smarter than me. <laughs> oh, dude. Cats are brilliant. Yeah. No, this guy in particular, I just the stuff he does, I just don't know how he has the brain capacity to do it. It's incredible. Uh, anyway. Uh-huh. So, um... Let's talk guitar some more. Are you? Uh, what do you use live compared to the studio? Are you bringing like the seventies AS three thirty five and stuff like that? Uh, you know, I didn't bring that out. I considered it, but I ended up not because you know, just it's already ha- it already has a lot of really cool wear on it because the the lady that owned it before me, she was like eighty eight years old. Yeah, and she played the shit out of that guitar. <laughs> I played it all the time, mm. and so she ended up. <clears throat> She sold it to a guitar center, and that's why I picked it up, if you could believe it. Yeah. Um, and so now, you know, it's just, it's perfectly played. Like, she's played it so much, all the mileage on the neck and everything, it's just great. And it's not, like, dinged up or messed up, it's just, like, played. So it's got all sorts of cool little, like, uh, blemishes. But it's like, by taking it on the road, I just know that moving around and jackets and hitting buttons and stuff, it's going to screw up. Mm-hmm what she created on this guitar and I don't want to ruin that so I just want to kind of maintain that integrity but uh, I took out my gold top I have a 2002 I think True Historic uh, 56 reissue and it just rules I love that guitar and again I'm playing a lot of P90s with Slash now mm-hmm. or trying to at least and I'm, I brought the garage that I recorded uh, with that's on the road and um my love, like, I'm, I'm trying to bring my Flying V out. I love my Flying V. I um, play a lot of the 335s in general, or I have a 355 that I love. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, and pedal-wise, a lot of people ask me, like, you know, what's on your pedal board? But it's, in this band, it's super basic because I'm playing rhythm, and I'm not taking any big leads. I mean, like, we used to play Night Train all the time, but we don't anymore. So now I just, you know, I just have a lot of delays. Mm. Some, uh which if I could recommend a pedal to anybody, it's um, Walrus Audio. Uh, it's called the ARP87. It is an incredible delay. Yeah. I swear by it now. What's what's so special about it? Well, it's got these uh, kind of like different, like not presets, but just settings that um, the guitarist of, of uh, Saturday Night Live recommended me to this, and he... He's like, you gotta check it out. It's got a couple. Of, I forget what it was. It was uh, it's like some cool ambient ones, and but the one that I use is called Lo-Fi Delay, and it just has this perfect balance. Like, I mean, it doesn't. I don't know. It just sounds so natural for what it is. Like, it's pretty out there, but it's just the coolest thing. Mm. It's. I, I really don't know how to describe it that well. It's like it's something I haven't had a whole lot of time with, but like I had it that whole last tour, and um, I really love it. It's just this. And it looks cool too. <laughs> <laughs> Always All the important. things you like. Well, you know, people were making fun of Billy Corgan last week when he said the color of a guitar, you know, changes how it sounds. And I think, like, if you if you have an emotional connection to a guitar, which can include, like, I love that color, it's going to change how you feel about that yeah. guitar, which is going to change the way you play on it. Oh yeah. Big I would never fault him for saying something like that because I think that's such a 
that's a cool thing. I think a guitar player, any guitar player that know that actually plays should take that for what he means by it. You know what I mean? It's like it makes perfect sense. Yeah. You could paint you could paint my favorite guitar in the worst color in the world, and I would hate it. <laughs> it's like <laughs> it would just it would make it so it would make it sound bad to me. Like I, I get that. Like I totally understand yeah. where he's coming from. Totally. Well, that looks like that's yeah, time. That's a cool cool thing he's said. Yeah. That looks like our time up already, so I better let you uh, get to the next interview. But, um, man, thanks for the chat. It's been really cool, and I'm bummed out I won't get to see you guys again this next tour. <sighs> yeah, man, I can't <laughs> wait. It was a real pleasure, man. We'll, we'll definitely we'll chat guitar some more. Yeah, cool. Awesome. See ya. All right, take care, man. You too. Bye.